And certainly if you already know Hero, you know, be sure to give a shout out. I, I have the vanity that I know everyone that Hero knows, but increasingly over time, I know that's not the case. So once upon a time, we had quite an overlap, but not so much now. I do see one of my students, at least from, who's in both, in, uh, so at least one of our students in here, Hero, is both in introductory sociology <laughs> and contemplative studies. So that's, Tristan. there he is. Josh has just waved, so. Hello, hello. Good. Ah, Camila is another person who's in both, well, at least in sociology, so maybe. Yes, after, hi. Hi, at least, and maybe in contemplative studies after this, too. So, Yoon, oh, very nice to see a former sociology student. I don't know everyone here, but I suspect I know a lot of you, so. We'll just, for those of you just joining, we'll just give it about, you know, two or three more minutes and um, to allow those people who got stuck in traffic to find a parking place and, and get here on time. And I'll uh, go ahead and introduce Hero at that point and we'll have a grand time thereafter. Ah, Josh is here too. So I knew I first met Josh about a decade ago, maybe even a dozen years ago now. And so he's been engaged in contemplative studies and practices for a while. That's wonderful. Yeah, so Yon is at University of Pennsylvania now too, right? If I remember correctly. Genevieve from Montreal. That's very nice. Thank you for joining us, Genevieve. Srini, it's so nice to see you here. Look forward to seeing you in person more. Yeah, I, me too. <laughs> I got to get out. Now, it's too easy to Zoom, but when your principal speaker is on the other side of the world, it's, you know, makes more sense to Zoom, I suppose. So, uh, hello, Penelope. Ah, good. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, Penelope, <laughs> you and I are going to have to talk more, okay? <laughs> sure. Well, that's great. I mean, uh, you know, uh, already part of my introduction is going to have to be altered, I think, because of all the people with the joint expertise is here, but um, you know, I'm delighted. Oh, good. Ah, Muchahit, were you in school at the same time as Hero? Yes, indeed. Hi, Mark. And hi, Hero, and everyone else. Yeah, yeah. thank you good for coming, you. Muchahit. Yeah, good to see you. My pleasure. After all these I years. <laughs> looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. So Mujahid is one of the people that uh, Hero and I knew from University of Michigan Times as well. So uh, and there may be more who arrive, but may, or is anyone from Ann Arbor here as well? Oh my gosh, Mary, I didn't, oh! <laughs> Did you see Hero, that Mary's here? Good to see you, Hero. Good to see you too, yeah. She was my senior. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. But she couldn't I couldn't she couldn't top me in being senior there. So that's that's 
I'm, I feel like I'm senior to everyone nowadays. So, well, maybe it's a good time for us to get started. Um, so allow me, everyone, uh, oh, first of all, to, to mark that we are recording. So keep that in mind, please. Um, allow me to welcome you to this evening's presentation and discussion by Hiro Saito on sociological imagination, contemplative practice, and social change. This is an ideal title. Hiro is an ideal speaker. And I imagine, given who I know in the room already and who I think is in the room, uh, this is an ideal Zoom audience for this first presentation bringing together sociology and contemplative studies here at Brown University. So my name is Michael Kennedy. I'm a professor of sociology and international and public affairs here at Brown. I am also this term serving as interim director for contemplative studies while Hal Roth enjoys, enjoys some much deserved sabbatical time, but he is also here. So thank you, Hal, for this opportunity and for the support for the sociology contemplative studies engagement. I suspect that there are many folks in this room who know contemplative studies super well. And many in this room who knew who know sociology super well, but there are too few of us who know both super well. I hope one outcome of this engagement will be many more people following the example of Hiro Saito and figuring the connection between these knowledge cultures. Hiro is right now an associate professor of sociology at Singapore Management University. His lifelong commitment has been to move sociology into a more transformative knowledge practice, enhancing both societies and individuals' well-being. He began his mindfulness practice at the Ann Arbor School of Yoga in 2007. At the time, Michigan sociology did not have such a concentration. Uh, he continued yoga in Honolulu after finishing his PhD in sociology at Michigan, where Muchahit, Mary, and I also enjoyed his company. Uh, Hero's yoga grew dramatically when his wife, Mickey, joined him in Singapore, and in the process of deepening his training with her, his awareness of body, mind, and spirit grew dramatically. Those capacities grew further as he invested more in the experience of meditation. Over the last several years, Hero has deepened his practice substantially through teachings and communities associated with Thich Nhat Hanh, alongside different kinds of mindfulness-based training from MBSR to MBSAT. Although I know Hero well and have always admired him, serendipity happened to knock this past summer when I saw Hero's TED Talk on mindfulness and the sociological imagination. In it, he explained how mindfulness practice helps to cultivate awareness of what is happening in our minds and how social science helps to expand that awareness from what's happening in our minds to what's happening in the world. And in that, he invited us in that TED Talk to think with him about how those two kinds of awareness might combine to improve the well being not only of individuals, but of the societies in which they live, in which we live. Tonight is a great invitation to extend our collective capacity to do just that. I am terrifically honored to be able to introduce you all right now to Hiro Saito. So help me welcome him. And I don't know what the Zoom thing is, you know, something like that. But also, oh, that's right. Thank you, Mary. Or the, oh, those hands clapping. So that reminds me. Um, thank you, Penelope. So when... Uh, it comes time to talk. I'll, t I'll take the cue. And Hero said that he'd be talking, I think, do I remember properly, for about a half an hour? And then we'll turn it into more of a conversation then. So, ladies and gentlemen, Hero Saito. Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your very kind uh, introduction. And many thanks to you and other members of uh, Brown University for hosting me today. So yes, uh, I'd like to keep my talk relatively short, uh, 30 minutes, so we'll have a plenty of time for our conversation. Yeah, as Michael said, this is an invitation for us to explore connections between sociology and contemplative studies. 
So on that note, um, let me begin. So this is my overall question for today's lecture, which is how might sociological imagination and contemplative practice help us rearticulate the mission of higher education as a facilitator of holistic growth, collective awakening, and social change. And here, when I talk about contemplative practice, uh, I limit myself to mindfulness practice. And I'm not familiar with other traditions. So you know, if you, um, the audience, are familiar with other traditions of contemplation, spirituality, you know, I, do, I would really appreciate your thoughts during Q&A. But in my talk, I limit myself to mindfulness practice. So this is my overall question. So uh, now let's start with sociological imagination. So what is this? And to explain this, especially to contemplative studies people, I use uh, C. Wright Mills because he invented this term, sociological imagination. And this is his famous definition. Quote, the sociological imagination enables us to grasp history and biography and the relations between the two within society. That is its task and its promise. To recognize this task and this promise is a mark of the classic social analyst. Um, yeah. Then, you know, uh, by using this sociological imagination, uh, Mills goes on to make a distinction, oops, sorry, um, between public issue and private trouble. Unquote. Uh, perhaps the most fruitful distinction with which the sociological imagination works is between the personal troubles or milieu and the public issues of social structure. This distinction is an essential tool of the sociological imagination and a feature of all classic work in social science. So by using this uh, sociological, sociological imagination, males uh, propose to you know, distinguish uh, public issues and personal trouble. You know, there are some, something that looks merely a personal trouble, but he wanted to uncover actually behind this personal trouble, there's a public structure issue. So from this sociological perspective, um, in a way, uh, it's unfortunate, but it's to some extent tend inevitable that some of the mainstream uh, mindfulness practices in today's world um, looks like they are reducing public issues to personal troubles. So basically, uh, there are many systemic structural issues that cause suffering, but mindfulness practitioners look as if, you know, they're asking individuals to cope with those structural systemic issues as personal troubles. So Ron Parsa, you know, he published this book, Mac Mindfulness. And in this book, uh, you know, he even includes MBSR as part of Mac Mindfulness, you know, corporate neoliberal appropriation of mindfulness. Then another book, Manufacturing Happy Citizens, uh, talks about how mindfulness, as well as positive psychology, is appropriated by capitalism. Then, of course, um, you know, she's critical, Barbara is critical of mindfulness practice, or, you know, wellness practices in general. And, you know, from um, Michael, I learned this book uh, recently, uh, The Mindful Elite, and how mindfulness practice has become an elitist thing in the US, especially. So there are already like, you know, um, sociological critiques of mindfulness practice in, in the contemporary world. So at SME right now, and this is for your information, we are now trying to um, you know, create a new mindfulness-based intervention for undergraduate students who will not, and, you know, and this program uh, will try to avoid this pitfall of mock mindfulness. So you know, this uh, new program that we are developing at uh, SMU, Singapore Management University, and we are going to have a first run um, next semester. 
we emphasize this relational mindfulness. So we are going to incorporate various practices and exercises to create a sense of connectedness and compassion toward other people. And also like, you know, we are trying to incorporate exercises and practices to uh, foster students' commitment to contribute the, to the wider society and the common good. So yeah, we are trying to address uh, some pitfalls of you know, current mindfulness practice. And in fact, um, you know, this uh, book, uh, Gretchen Stadel, Leading from Within, um, it's like a social change and mindfulness for social innovation. Uh, you know, this book for me is a, a first step in the right direction. So she wants to mobilize mindfulness practice for social change. And, you know, there's another recent book by Larry Ward. He's a practitioner in the tradition of the Pulan village. And he wrote this book, America's Racial Calm. It's, this book is basically about how we can mobilize mindfulness practice to heal racial injustices and sufferings in the US. And in a similar vein, uh, Rhonda Maggie, you know, she also has this book, The Inner Work of Racial Justice, Healing Ourselves and Transforming Our Communities Through Mindfulness. So again, she's mobilizing mindfulness for greater social justice. So there are already uh, various scholars and practitioners who are you know, uh, promoting mindfulness in a sociological way. Okay, now uh, let me talk about the same issue from the contemplative perspective. And here you know, I limit myself to mindfulness practice and also, especially like uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, I'm influenced by his writings. So, this is an excerpt from his essay called Call Me By My True Names. And here he recounts a tragedy during the Vietnam War. In the early years of my exile in France, I learned of an 11-year-old girl escaping from Vietnam with her family and other boat people. She was raped by a pirate right there on her boat. Her father tried to intervene, but the pirate threw her father into the sea. After a child was raped, she jumped into the ocean to commit suicide. So he, he could not heard this news and he was devastated. Then the evening in sitting meditation, I visualized myself being born as a baby boy into a very poor fishing family on the coast of Thailand. My father was a fisherman, he couldn't read, he had never gone to school or to the temple. Then my mother also couldn't read or write and she didn't know how to raise her children. Then when I turned 13, I also became a fisherman. I had never gone to school. I had never felt loved or understood. And I lived in chronic poverty that persisted from one generation to the next. Then Thich Nhat Hanh goes on to meditate. As I continued sitting, I saw hundreds of babies being born that night along the coast of Thailand in similar circumstances, many of them baby boys. If the politicians and cultural ministers could look deeply, they would see that within 20 years, those babies would become pirates. And to me, this is a you know, very clear example of sociological imagination. He is trying to understand you know, pirate and his uh, personal travel within the larger you know, social and structural context. And here we see contemplative practitioner using his sociological imagination. But then he goes on to say, um, when I put myself in the situation of being born into a family that was uneducated and poor from one generation to the next, I saw that I would not be able to avoid being a pirate. When I saw that, my hatred vanished and I could feel compassion for the pirate. And we can understand that you know, he does this to cultivate his compassion. But my question here is, but doesn't even the pirate have agency? Uh, here, agency is a you know, complex concept. So roughly and simply speaking, I define agency 
has a capacity to make a difference to a situation. So, but you know, to put it uh, more crudely, didn't even the pirate have a choice? Was it really inevitable for this baby boy to become a pirate? So from the sociological perspective, um, you know, we talk about this interplay between structure and agency. So probably uh, not many sociologists would say that you know, uh, these baby boys are determined, already determined to, structurally determined to become pirates. So there must be some interplay between objective structures and subjective structure or agency, you know, capacity to make a difference to a given situation. But then uh, at this point, for me, um, again, this contemplative perspective on this issue of agency is a little bit um, complicated. And if uh, there are Buddhist scholars in the audience, you know, I would love your feedback, thoughts on this. So on the one hand, you know, from this contemplative perspective, um, we, we can think of this in terms of so-called dependent origination, uh, meaning actually you know, the perpetrator, uh, he's not independent of his conditions. And you know, he's dependent on you know, his conditions, you know, his surroundings. And of course, like, this way of thinking helps us cultivate you know, compassion toward the perpetrator. But then, yeah, this can lead to um, determinism, or oh, this might lead to determinism. Okay, you know, perpetrator is dependent on his conditions, and his action is dependent on conditions, other conditions in the universe. So, you know, that uh, makes it look as if the perpetrator actually has no choice. But then on the other hand. Uh, Victor Frankl, you know, survivor of the Holocaust, and uh, many mindfulness practitioners and uh, instructors cite him because his writing exemplifies mindfulness in many important respects. And uh, this is one like you know, favorite quote among mindfulness instructors. Quote, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, you have freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. So in a given situation, there is always, in a way, absolute freedom, absolute inner freedom for us to decide how to choose to respond to a given situation. So in a way, uh, in my current thinking, you know, these two positions, dependent origination and Victor Frankl's discussion of absolute inner freedom, uh, in a way, maybe uh, there is a tension, but maybe we can you know, understand you know, being conditioned and being unconditioned as a continuum. So it's like you know, uh, continuous variable. So in a given situation, maybe, you know, okay, in this situation, you know, he was conditioned, let's say 40% uh, 40 and he was unconditioned 60%. Maybe, you know, um, thinking about these two extremes as continuum may can solve this tension that I see. But again, um, I would appreciate, especially if you are Buddhist scholars, I would appreciate your feedback uh, on this issue. So, but you know, in any, in any case, I see important convergence between sociology and mindfulness practice in understanding um, our agency and how our action is shaped by you know, conditions outside of us. So, so far so good. And you know, I think we can you know, uh, apply the same thinking to the victim too, the 11 year old girl. So um, in a way she exercised her agency by choosing to exit from the situation, by removing herself from the situation. So that's her agency. And like, but of course I can, she had to do that within you know, various given objective conditions. So 
whether we are talking about the perpetrator or the victim, uh, sociological and contemplative perspectives seem to converge to a large extent. But for me, uh, the real question, or like, you know, more important challenge is how about our own agency? So far, we have talked about the perpetrator and the victim as an observer, but we are also participant in this world too. So put another way, what is our responsibility? What is our response ability for what's happening in the world, including the tragedy uh, of the baby boy pirate and the 11 year old girl? So what's our responsibility? So from the sociological perspective, uh, we can think about this in terms of performativity. Uh, let me start with reflexivity. So with the reflexivity, we sociologists can reflect on what's our relationship with the world we study and what's the role of social science in this world, right? So that's already done by sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu. You know, he thinks that by reflexively studying objective conditions, that constrain and enable our sociological research, we can actually increase um, objectivity of our research. And in a way, he's right. Um, if we become reflexive, we can actually you know, begin to explore how, uh, what, what cognitive biases we might have as sociologists, uh, not only as like you know, psychological human beings, but also as a result of us being shaped by our objective conditions. So reflexivity is useful because it increases our objectivity in the sense of us becoming more aware of cognitive biases that we have. And another way to branch out from reflexivity is performativity, you know, Foucault. And he talks about the relationship between power and knowledge, right? And this is an excerpt from Foucault's essay, Truth and Power. It's not a matter of emancipating truth from every system power, which would be a chimera for truth is already power, but of detaching the power of truth from the forms of hegemony, social, economic, and cultural, within which it operates at the present time. So, you know, once we become aware of how we are implicated in the network of power in the world. You know, in addition to just um, increasing our objectivity, we can actually insert ourselves differently in the world. So we can begin to change what's happening in the world. Because, you know, for example, many technical policy issues require you know, expertise, right? And we social scientists and other scientists offer expertise. So that means that we have the power to shape policies. And you know, that line of you know, thinking was further developed by Bruno Latour, a French philosopher of science and science and technology studies scholar who passed away recently. So, you know, uh, from this perspective, um, you know, sociologist has Sociologists have the following responsibility. So first, you know, we can offer a deep understanding of the world uh, to you know, people who are interested. And by offering at least, but at least by offering this deep understanding of the world, we can actually support people you know, who want to change the world. Because to change the world, we need a deep and quote unquote accurate understanding of what's going on. So by offering our knowledge to the public, uh, we sociologists can begin to uh, respond to the world. Then how about you know, contemplative perspective? And here I approach this discussion of our response ability in terms of interbeing. So a you know, concept introduced by Thich Nhat Hanh, but essentially it's about emptiness. Uh, 
in the Buddhist tradition. So in the same essay, you know, call me by my true names. You know, he goes on to say this. I am the child in Uganda or the Congo, all skin and bones. And I'm also the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to the Congo. Then, but here in the US, uh, blah, blah, blah. Then, if you call the name of the child in the Congo, I answer yes. If you call the name of those who produce the bombs and the guns, I also answer yes. When I'm able to see that I'm all those people, my hatred, my hatred disappears, and I am determined to live in such a way that I can help the victims and also help those who create and perpetuate wars and destruction. So he's saying, I am you. I am all these beings in the universe or in the world. So of course, I am responsible for what's happening to other me's, other myself in the world because what's happening to other people in the world are part of me. So that's uh, what you know, uh, this insight of interbeing tries to cultivate. And if, you know, in a way, if what's, like, you know, uh, if what's happening in the world, if everything is part of me, and if I care about myself, and if I love myself, then of course I feel compelled to respond to the sufferings in the world because they are part of me. So that's uh, how uh, mindfulness practice approaches the issue of responsibility. But you know, here, um, you know, to expand on this um, you know, contemplative perspective on responsibility, now I want to bring in uh, this discussion of um, energy and energy of our response and our action for social change. And if the, this word energy sounds too fluffy or spiritual to you, you can understand it uh, as a subjectively felt emotional state or somatic state. That's what um, at least I mean by energy. Or, you know, and that's how we can understand it uh, in a scientific, quote unquote, sci scientific or psychological way subjectively felt emotional or somatic state. And here, you know, the Dalai Lama is, uh, offers us very interesting uh, commentary. So he has this book, Be Angry. And he says, in Buddhism, the true meaning of the middle way is moving dynamically between the two, experiencing both. Suffering should make us angry. This type of anger moves us toward a wrathful compassion to take action to end suffering. So he says, like, no, uh, mindfulness or contemplative practitioners cannot remain indifferent to what's happening in the world. But note that you know, even though we feel angry initially, he's saying that we need to transform our anger into compassion. And essentially, it's compassion that must inform that motivate our action. And, you know, this uh, insight, yeah, was captured by Martin Luther King Jr. And this is Yang Thich Nhat Hanh. And both of them, I'm sure they were angry about um, racial injustice. You know, racial injustice against Blacks in the US and racial injustice against the Vietnamese. But then they actually like, you know, acted with this energy of compassion. You know, compassion encompassing even quote unquote perpetrators who will be also part of a more just society. So we, you know, they, they, they didn't lash out against uh, perpetrators. They recognized their anger, they transformed it compassion and they acted with the energy of compassion, inclusive of their perpetrators. And that's how uh, these people try to bring about social change. And you know, this part, actually this insight was um, articulated by many, many other peace activists. 
So for example, uh, Gandhi famously said, there is no path to peace, peace is the path. So if we want a peaceful society, and if we want happy society, you know, when we take actions to move towards such a society, we already must embody the energy of peace and happiness that we want to see in our future society. So unless we already embody this energy that we want to see in the world, even if we take actions, our actions will not lead to you know, what we hope to achieve. So that's the insight from these uh, practitioners of social change. But of course, like you know, social change, you know, our effort for social change doesn't have to be you know, always very serious and sober. You know, we can have the joy, uh, like you know, the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh did in these pictures. Okay, so. Here, um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm now moving toward uh, my conclusion. So how can we combine social security imagination contemplative practice in higher education? Because like most of us are in higher education institutions to facilitate social change. So on the one hand, critique, you know, there's a, in the sense of critical understanding based on sociological imagination often lacks uh, compassion and love toward it's target, especially like you know, people who I we we disagree with, or like, you know, problems that we we want we want to solve, or toward you know people who we perceive to be causing social problems. So we tend to we offer critique, or we tend to lack compassion, love. So this part can be complemented by contemplative practice that cultivates understanding, compassion, and love. Then on the other hand, contemplative practice often lacks critical perspectives on systemic, uh, systemic causes of suffering in the world. And you know, this can be complemented by uh, sociological imagination. So perhaps you know, uh, when we practice contemplation, including mindfulness, yeah, we can draw on sociology to expand our you know, critical perspectives on you know, what's happening in the world. So I feel uh, higher education institutions will do well by promoting a holistic education that cultivates both critical thinking, you know, the intellect, and compassion, you know, the heart for social change. But you know, I'm not the first one who is saying this actually. So there are already you know group of scholars and practitioners who are pursuing this path, you know, mobilizing both sociological critical understanding and contemplative um, you know, practice for transforming higher education institutions. So this book, Contemplative Approaches to Sustainability in Higher Education, The Soul of Higher Education, you know, Contemplative Pedagogy, Research and Institutional Life for the 21st Century, uh, integrating mindfulness into anti-oppression pedagogy beyond white mindfulness and creating a culture of mindful innovation in higher education. So there's already an emerging movement to mobilize both critical understanding and contemplative compassion to transform higher education institutions. So uh, I'm simply adding you know, my own voice to the emerging movement. And I will be very uh, you know, happy to contribute to this emerging movement. OK. So actually, I have a few more slides, but I have already talked for uh, 30 minutes. So uh, what, what, do you, uh, what does the audience want? Do you, do you guys uh, want to? Uh, start conversations, or do you want me to uh, quickly finish what I have left? I think it's going to be hard for us to achieve consensus. Okay. So I'm going to just say that I'd love to see what you have left. Okay, then, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh,
Yeah, so thank you for understanding, um, for going over the you know, time a little bit. Uh, okay, so now, you know, I have um, kind of, you know, uh, elaborated on what I already said in my TED talk uh, in, so, uh, in slides so far, but you know, I want to share with you my latest reflections, my deepening uh, reflections. So here, you know, I want to pose this question. What's the nature of social change? So Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, he said um, back in 2006, quote, uh, Buddha means awakened person. Buddhism is about awakening and we need collective awakening. That's what he said at the UNESCO headquarters. And this um, you know, keyword, collective awakening is very interesting um, because you know, here, okay, I'll share with you my latest reflection, new age. You know, it's like an American spiritual tradition. New Age offer, may offer a really interesting um, food for thought for exploring the connection between sociological imagination and contemplative practice. And maybe some of you know this uh, series of novels by James Redfield. It's hard to classify him. Some people classify him as New Age Christian, but he doesn't want to identify himself as a Christian. But you know, he wrote down um, these books. Um, uh, the main protagonist, the hero in this book, has a sociology degree. So you know, the so sociologist is a main protagonist in these novels. And actually, James Redfield has an undergraduate degree in sociology too. And you know, this connection between spirituality and sociology is interesting because it was observed by Alvin Goldner too. You know, in this book, a huge book, The Coming Crisis of Western Sociology, he, he's actually critical of this, but you know, he, you know, he's critical of Marx, Durkheim, Parsons, all these theorists, because Gudna uh, senses religiosity or spirituality behind their writings, you know, society being sacred, for example, or like, you know, human flourishing being the end point of human evolution or awakening. So Gudna was really critical of this um, religious and uh, spiritual undertone of sociology. And he wanted to get rid of it, but still he did sense it. There's, there may be some interesting deep connection between sociology and spirituality or religiosity. And in this regard, yeah, Rudolf Steiner, He's very interesting. Uh, you know, he started out as a member of the German branch of theosophy. So theosophy, it's an like American religious movement or a spiritual movement. And some people regard it as a precursor to new age. Then he broke away from the German branch of theosophy. Then he founded his own anthroposophy. And on the one hand, you know, in these writings, so, Steiner, Steiner produced these writings on society. And in these writings, you know, he engages with Marx and other social theorists. And like, you know, he wants to advance like, you know, his theory of how we can make society better. Then on the other hand, he left extensive instructions on how to meditate. So uh, by the way, uh, for some, you know, anyone who is not familiar with R Rudolf Steiner, he's probably best known for Wadoff School. You know, he started uh, alternative education, and there are Wadoff alternative schools uh, in the US too. So here is a um, like, you know, early 20th century spiritualist and um, social theorist who saw the connection between collective awakening and individual awakening. Then, you know, I'm thinking about like you know, this uh, collective awakening, collective awakening in terms of um, generation. And this is a um, sociologist, Karl Mahan. And he's famous for his uh, discussion of the problem of generations. And for him, Generation is really important driving force of social change. 
in a way, generation is a natural, almost natural driving force of social change. So sociologically, different generations grow up in different objective conditions. So they naturally develop different values, orientations. So, you know, generational change may be really slow, but in a way, it's the most powerful and surest way of social change. And here again, uh, new age people offer us some, you know, some really interesting food for thought. So this is a new age psychologist, Doreen Virtue. You know, she, she wrote this book, Indigo, Crystal, and Rainbow Children. And what she, she says, and you know, this is said by other new age people, is that different generations actually have different spiritual orientations. And younger generations are born with more enlightened, spiritually advanced souls. And that's why she thinks uh, you know, collective awakening is happening because younger generations are spiritually wiser. And they call these younger generations, you know, indigo, or crystal, and rainbow children. Okay, this is a metaphysical argument. So we cannot empirically you know, prove or disprove it. Yeah, but that's how new age people think about generational change and social change. And uh, it's an you know, interesting coincidence. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh also has this poem called The Rainbow Children. Uh, toward the end, he says, you know, what a magnificent morning on this clear blue planet. At this very moment when the multitude of stars melts into the celestial dome, children, children by the thousands, Children of all colors climb up the mountain and look down below with utmost attention. They are watching me. So in a way, he invokes, uh, in a way, this imagery, which is in a way similar to new age imagery. Like you know, children, new generations are coming into our Earth, plan in our planet Earth, and like, you know, in a way, they are, I'm not sure that they are you know, spiritually more enlightened, but the you know, children coming into our earth. So for kicking at the hand, this was a very important issue, actually. So and this, is, this question is, how might we actively empower younger generations as agents of social change? So for Mannheim, in a way, generation is a natural, uh, driving force of social change. But in a way, Thich Nhat Hanh is asking, how can we accelerate this social change, right? So instead of like, you know, simply uh, letting younger generations grow up, how can we actively empower younger generations so that you know, collectively we can move toward better or more enlightened society? So that's why Thich Nhat Hanh and the plant and village tradition extensively works with children and younger generations. So again, you know, I want to make this uh, discussion a little bit more concrete. And I want to uh, you know, conclude my reflection with this question. And I'm glad that you know, there are some undergraduate students uh, in the audience today. So you know, how do we work with and work for younger generations? You know, our younger selves for social change. And here again, I want to draw on Martin Luther King Jr. So this is an excerpt from his famous, I have a dream speech. I have a dream for that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. So here he has only love, and goodwill for younger generations. And he goes on to say, I have seen the promised land. And so this is his last speech before he was assassinated. I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. So here he clearly recognizes, you know, we individual beings are part of the same flow of life. So that's why you know, Thich Nhat Hanh um, uses this imagery, go as a river. So we are individual droplets, you know, water droplets, and we form one single flow of life. 
So, you know, we inherit some uh, negative habits from our ancestors, but, you know, we try to make sure that our younger generations will not inherit, you know, those negative habits that we inherited. So we try to cultivate, uh, you know, positive habits um, among younger generations. So as a river, eventually, you know, we can get to um, a state of enlightenment or like a you know, better, happier society. So that's why both Thich Nhat Hanh and Dalai Lama, you know, he emphasized, uh, they emphasize the importance of helping younger generations cultivate positive seeds. So now, okay, I'm finally concluding. Yeah, thank you for your patience. So again, I come back to this um, program question. How my sociological imagination and contemplative practice help us rearticulate the mission of higher education as a facilitator of holistic growth, collective awakening, and social change. And we can think about this as an intellectual program. Also, we can uh, think of this as a creative design challenge. How might we reform or transform our courses, our faculty development programs, and other things to you know, more effectively combine sociological imagination and contemplative practice for social change. So we can think about this either intellectually or as a design, creative design challenge. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for your patience. And you know, I, as uh, Michael said, I promote mindfulness practice playfully by making uh, these Instagram videos. So if you are interested, yeah, please go check them out. Okay, thank you, I'm done. Thank you so much, Hiro. I think you can see the applause. We should be able to hear it as well, I guess. I don't know. Well, that's right, we, we can do this. Uh, this is very nice. It's very joyful, actually. I never thought about it because, you know, clapping, and now I'm thinking more about one hand clapping a lot, but, you know, so, well, um, why don't we turn this into discussion? Because I know Hero is eager to engage you all, and I suspect y'all are indeed eager to engage him. So I'll keep a list of uh, hands that I see go up. And um, is anyone ready to kick us off here? Ah, oh, Srini, thank you. Hi, I'll turn on my video too. <laughs> Hello. Thank, thank you, Hiro-san, very much. A um, lot of uh, thoughts came up throughout the talk and I really appreciate the kind of large layout of so many issues that you put together. But if I, if I could kind of um, frame this question in regard to maybe just the last thing that you left us with, um, how do you kind of see these potential innovations um, and how do you reconcile them with the fact that <clears throat> higher education right now remains a pretty elitist and highly capitalist endeavor overall? Um, so how can we kind of, you know, reconcile that, that tension? Mm. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a great uh, question. So in my uh, own um, practice, so, you know, uh, so I, I'm going to share with you uh, my own practice. And, I, you know, this may not be uh, a perfect answer, but uh, I'm approaching this issue from two different venues. Uh, one is uh, faculty development. So I'm, I'm getting involved in faculty development. And because to me, the key to transforming higher education institutions is to transform faculty members <clears throat> because we are the core of higher education institutions. So right now, um, you know, at the Center for Teaching Excellence, for example, uh, we often focus on simply providing technical workshops, like you know, how to use um, Zoom or like, you know, latest apps and so on. But, I feel uh, we can actually do better uh, in transforming professors, instructors, attitudes, or hearts regarding you know, education, you know, and regarding teaching uh, younger generations. So what I'm passing right now at SMU and in Japan 
is to incorporate mindfulness practice, mindfulness training into faculty development practices to cultivate um, like, you know, compassion and love uh, in, terms, you know, in teaching younger generations and thinking about larger social issues. So that's my uh, first venue for pursuing social change. So through faculty development. And the second venue I'm pursuing is um, social innovation. So how, so now I'm now uh, you know, cultivating collaborations between universities and outside stakeholders. Outside stakeholders can be local communities, disadvantaged communities, or you know, stakeholders can include businesses. Uh, so by like, you know, incorporate uh, greater engagement with the public, with the outside world into the curriculum of higher education. I'm hoping that um, more and more people, more and more faculty members will become conscious of potential public impact of their research and teaching. And yeah, I don't have like, you know, perfect solution. So, you know, this is an ongoing experimentation. So I'm approaching this, uh, this issue as I, um, you know, in two uh, venues, faculty development and social innovation. I'm like working, creating uh, courses that involve collaboration with um, stakeholders outside higher education institutions. So that's where my experimentation is going. And yeah, I, I'd love to, um, you know, talk with you more, you know, and you know, brainstorm, you know, what kind of a, more, what kind of like, you know, new experimentations we might uh, do, yeah. So yeah, thank you for your question. Very good question. Thank you, Shmini. Thank you, Hiro. We have uh, six or seven hands up already. I should ask if anyone wants to follow up on this line. I was looking at Mary Wright smiling because she is heading up our teaching and learning center here at Brown. And so I was wondering, I mean, Mary, is this a follow up on what Srini was just saying? Well, I'm, I'm happy to pick up on the queue, Michael. Thank you for the invitation. So, so um, hi, Hero. I, I, as Michael was saying, I direct the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning, which is one location for what I would call educational development at Brown. And I use mm -hmm. that word deliberately because we uh, work with faculty, graduate students, and also have a high proportion of undergraduates in teaching roles too. Um, but I'm thinking about a session that we had earlier in the term where Eric Lux, who directs our Mindfulness Center, talked about a new book that he has out, um, Mindfulness and the College Student. Hmm. And we had a very good uh, discussion about the potential harm that mindfulness practice might do in the context of a classroom. And so you mentioned very, what I would call great aims. So looking at contemplative practice as a facilitator of growth, social change, collective awakening in higher education. But I also wonder if there are ways that it might do harm and want to sort of make that explicit so we can mitigate harm too. Mm. Yeah, so uh, Mary, uh, that's a great question. And uh, thank you for asking that. So, I think you know, I tend to think about this um, in terms of, okay, the following. The one is, you know, I think, you know, when I uh, look at, you know, research on mindfulness-based interventions, you know, K to 12, um, you know, I, I found um, this, you know, uh, review article saying, actually, um, mindfulness practice, well, let's say like, you know, five minute meditation at the beginning of, you know, every class, it's not effective if instructor doesn't embody mindfulness for the rest of uh, his class. So we just give students like a five minute meditation, but if an instructor is not trained in mindfulness and if like, he's not very mindful for the rest of um, his class time, this intervention fails and it's not very effective. And yeah, maybe it can cause harm too. And then, but you know, maybe then you know, one point is, and this is especially um, emphasized by the Plan Village tradition, is teachers, okay, you know, we instructors, we don't have to give students a five-minute meditation session, not at all. 
what we do is to embody mindfulness in our instruction, how we speak, how we relate to our students, right? So this indirect embodiment, uh, this like embodied mindfulness indirectly, but effectively affects students. So according to this um, review article, uh, the best scenario, the best, the most effective intervention is first, instructors embody mindfulness. And if you know, instructors embody mindfulness, students will notice, okay, he or she is different. You know, he's calm, he's kind, and we feel uh, secure. So that kind of visceral reactions can happen among students if instructors already embody mindfulness. Then, only then, the instructors can consider introducing more formal meditation, let's say five minute meditation at the beginning of every class. So either way, one way to mitigate uh, potential negative effects or one way to maximize potential benefits of mindfulness intervention is uh, faculty members first practice mindfulness and embody it. And in their classes, they don't have to talk about mindfulness at all, actually. And then you know, students can benefit from mindfulness practice. And that's why I focus on faculty development. Right. So first, let's help faculty members become more mindful, you know, compassion, compassionate understanding. And another you know, angle on this is you know, there are two ways to approach uh, incorporating mindfulness interventions in higher education institutions. One is what I call modular conventional approach. Modular conventional approach is like, uh, let's just like, you know, teach students in BSR, or like you know, ready-made, scientifically validated uh, you know, programs. But then this modular approach uh, isolates mindfulness from the rest of the curriculum. So you know, students learn you know, how to meditate, but then in other parts of their days, I, their every day and every day learning, and they don't practice mindfulness. Then another approach is more organic and holistic approach, meaning we try to incorporate um, you know, mindfulness across a wide variety of activities that students engage in throughout their days and throughout their years. And actually, uh, last week, I gave a workshop at the La Salle College of Arts in Singapore. And there, I sat down with art, art educators. And we talked about how we can actually do this organic, a holistic approach to incorporate uh, mindfulness into arts education, instead of you know, simply teaching MBSR as a modular program that students can take. So yeah, so thank you for uh, this question, uh, Mari. Uh, so again, my, my thought is still like a you know, work in progress, but uh, this is a very important issue. And I want to uh, continue to think about it. Yeah, so thank you. Well, thank you. That was a very thorough and interesting answer. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Mary and Hero. Um, I just, Aaron Wu was asking if uh, you might repeat the name of that article. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I can send it to you later. It's a review article. And okay. I, I'm not sure that I can. Oh, but okay. yeah, I think we'll, I, we'll get it. We'll get it to you, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, Hal, did I see you putting up a like a second hand? You know, like a follow up there. Uh, yes, uh, Michael. Um, actually, I was going to go in a completely different direction, but maybe I can circle back there. Um, I wanted to uh, do a couple of things. First is, um, uh, Mary, we haven't yet met, um, but I, I, it's nice to meet you online. Um, I've been teaching a variety of courses here. Uh, starting in the spring of 2000, so for over 20 years, in which we have integrated contemplative practices uh, of various kinds, mostly sitting meditation, but sometimes moving meditation, um, into uh, the classroom. And uh, in addition to the normal meeting times for our courses, seminars, lecture courses, whatever, we have had two to three 
50 minute sessions a week of contemplative devoted contemplative practice that is directly related to the readings that we're doing in the course with the encouragement that and the support for students to integrate what they're reading about in the course materials from the various contemplative traditions uh, throughout the world from which these practices which have been scientized and medicalized into things like MBSR uh, have been taken. So the emphasis is on the, the kind of deeper historical and cultural context of the contemplative practices, looking at how they were developed uh, within those cultural and historical contexts, but also then uh, with the understanding that and the commitment to the idea that these practices help people deal with common problems of human existence and meaning and purpose in our lives, that they're also relevant today and encouraging students to incorporate them into their lives. Now, um, Eric um, uh, is, a, is a good friend and, and a colleague, and um, I've supported the work of the Mindfulness Center from way before it got set up. Um, and uh, Eric has been very much influenced by the research of uh, one or two people on, on negative outcomes. Uh, and I can, uh, I can talk from my own experience of teaching probably well over 1,500 students in contexts like this over, over uh, 20, 22 years that those outcomes are, are really minimal. Um, uh, the kinds of outcomes that the researchers have been looking at um, uh, often come uh, within dedicated contemplative practitioners in contemplative practice centers uh, throughout North America. And uh, the concern that these kinds of things develop in the classrooms, uh, I think, is overstated. Uh, I would be happy to meet with you and discuss that further. I just wanted to be clear that there's not a unanimity of opinion about this. Um, I love um, what uh, Hiro said it, uh, about embodying the mindfulness practices and not just kind of throwing them out there. I think it's very important to, to do that in, in the classroom. Uh, I love the appeal to Rudolf Steiner. Um, um, <clears throat> I don't know how well Steiner is known, but um, I consider him to be a really interesting and innovative thinker. And uh, I wanted to touch base finally <clears throat> with um, Thich Nhat Hanh's insights into what he calls interbeing and how that relates to the kind of combination of uh, bringing contemplative practice and sociology together. and and you began with talking about uh, dependent origination, about pratitya samadpada is the technical term, uh, which through the eyes of Thich Nhat Hanh, we could say interdependent uh, origination. And that is that we exist in interdependence with everything that's in the universe right now. Um, and that we don't, we can't normally appreciate the extent to which uh, all these causes and conditions have led us here and have supported us uh, being here. And so without ignoring uh, multiplicity, without ignoring diversity, without ignoring the effects um, of, of social and political factors on human beings, um, what the Dalai Lama and Martin Luther King and Thich Nhat Hanh really seem to be indicating is that there is a certain commonality, a core um, to all sentient creatures, not just human beings, all sentient creatures, we could call just, you know, consciousness. Uh, um, Thich Nhat Hanh ch chose not to call it that, but um, it comes out of that the Buddhist tradition that sees unity and multiplicity as simultaneously being relevant in our lives. And so the multiplicity we uh, and the diversity we can get at through sociology and, and understanding the greater context in which each and every one of us is existing at this very moment. But also we should never fail to approach our work in making this a better world from our sense of common ground. So I'll just leave it there, thanks.
Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much for your kind words and you know, very um, yeah, insightful you know, comments on you know, interbeing, yeah, so interdependent origination. And I just want to you know, um, build on what Hal said uh, in, and also like you know, uh, expand our perspective on our earlier discussion of mindfulness intervention. I think if I feel um, the risk of you know, mindfulness-based intervention can increase, if we lose sight of what um, Hal emphasized, um, you know, commonality among sentient beings or our interdependency, um, because if we like to practice uh, MBSR, for example, within the frame of individualism, okay, and I just want to uh, get better myself, then if we lose sight of interbeing or interdependent origination, our interdependency with the rest of beings, with the rest of the world, we lose that sense of commonality. Then I think mindfulness uh, intervention can lead to maybe like you know, selfishness or kind of like you know, self-containedness. Um, so that point, um, this um, emphasis on commonality and interdependency, I think that will be, I feel, a very important key to steering mindfulness-based interventions in higher education toward more positive uh, outcome. Yeah, so thank you for sharing your uh, insight, Hal. Thank you, Hiro. Thank you, Hal. It's always a great pleasure when I get to see uh, former students in the room. Uh, I saw Jacob Rose with his hand up first, but Jacob, you've let your hair grow since I saw you last, I think, so. It's been a long pandemic. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, my name is Jacob Rose. I'm a PhD student in engineering. So uh, much of this is very much, uh, I did not know what to expect coming to this talk, but uh, it's a very pleasant yeah, activity for the evening. Um, and a couple of things you, you mentioned, especially towards the end, kind of rang true, uh, like reminded me of some work that I've done over, I guess, the past 10 years, um, separate from school. Um, in youth empowerment. So when you ask the question, how might we activate and empower younger generations as agents of social change? Um, it reminded me of essentially, so there's this program called Power of Hope. They uh, run summer camps for teenagers, 14 to 18. Um, and they uh, run on this kind of creative community model where over about a week, we develop this very close knit community uh, through very carefully tailored kind of uh, progression of uh, like getting people to let down boundaries and like and express themselves creatively. Um, and so one of the key um, aspects of this program is this ceremony about uh, three or four days into the week called Heart Circle. And so um, when you mentioned when you when you gave your uh, your tree diagram of uh, mindful mindfulness based holistic education. You had listed focus mindfulness, purposeful mindfulness, and relational mindfulness. So those were what rang uh, this bell. So essentially, to not uh, to oversimplify the ceremony, um, the community kind of comes together in, uh, in the evening, and we kind of sit around this ceremonial space where there's one sp space in the center, and kind of popcorn style, no uh, like hands raised or anything. People who feel compelled to speak uh, one by one will go into the center of the circle. And throughout the evening, the only person speaking is the person in the center. And essentially the role of everyone else is to kind of observe and and uh, and like hold the space. And so what ends up happening is we kind of, we give some kind of prompt. It's often essentially like, what do you need to say to step into your own power? Um, and so what, yeah, what ends up happening is people share like some mundane stories, some funny stories. People share the full range of human experience, um, these 14 to 18 year olds. Um, and it's, it essentially, I went as a teenager and I volunteered for years afterwards. So I've had to, I've gotten to see many iterations of this, but what uh, resonated with me was I realized characterizing the impact of the ceremony as the beginning of it, focus, focus mindfulness, there's often the kind of a reflection period before the ceremony where you think about 
what might I want to share tonight? Um, and then I think purposeful mindfulness, uh, relational mindfulness is, is what uh, I think rings most true is that the act of, of witnessing other people express their, their truths, um, uh, at least speaking personally, uh, constantly there's, there's kind of an internal dialogue of relating my own experience. Um, often it's either a little bit related or not at all related, but what it allows is a kind of like broadening of an awareness of this kind of full range of human experience that's not cheapening any of your own personal experience, but also builds a, like a, a very, very rapidly a deeper trust with these people who you met three days ago. So um, I, found, I found that to be a, a really interesting framing for that ceremony. Um, and I think to kind of close that, um, one of the key observations I've seen a lot of people reflect on the regarding the value of the ceremony is that um, particularly in the West, uh, young people kind of have a lack of ceremony in their lives. And there's kind of a, a cheapening of ceremony and it's not, uh, the concept isn't really well understood in a lot of spaces. Um, and so my own introduction to the concept of what ceremony is and why it's a valuable experience was through experiencing these, these uh, many iterations of hard circles. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge that you expressed of, of kind of bringing these like these reflections, these kinds of um, contradictions into spaces like the academy um, is something I've, I've really uh, wanted to, I, I've been reflecting on for years and it's something I'm constantly interested in, in asking. So thank you for framing that question. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Jacob, uh, so much for you know, sharing your experience and you know, perspectives and observations. And yeah, you know, uh, listening to you, you know, young people like you, you know, makes me hopeful. I mean, of course, we have our responsibility. Our generations have our own responsibility to the world, <clears throat> including, you know, climate crisis, um, you know, inequality, increasing inequalities and so forth, and racism. But then, yeah, you know listening to you and how you work with um, you know, younger generations. Yeah, it, it's really it's really wonderful and uh, inspiring. Yeah, so, and yeah, I hope, um, you know, I and you know, other like-minded colleagues can support you uh, and support your endeavors, you know, to empower younger generations. And you, you guys are, you know, from my like a spiritual perspective, younger generations are wiser, so, yeah, in a way, I'm wondering how I can serve younger generations, you know, too. Because right now, in a way, right, um, our thinking, uh, older generations, is in a way, in some way, constrained by negative habits of thinking uh, that you know, we have inherited from the past. But I think if I can help you know, younger generations like you not to inherit these negative habits and you know, more cultivate your positive habits, you guys will be, your, your thinking will be more elevated. So younger generations will be able to respond to the world in such a way that we, older generations, cannot imagine, you know, given our conditions. So yeah, I, I really am listening to your you know, observation. I really, I, I, I'm really encouraged. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. This is actually a perfect sequel because Jacob was this was in this remarkable class on knowledge networks and global transformations. The next person to speak is So Yun Kim, who is in I don't remember which classes it was, but in some kind of engaged scholarship. And then, you know, following her, we'll hear Josh Gerber, who's presently in introductory sociology. So Yun, would you take over? Yeah, thank you so much for um the opportunity and um thank you for hosting this wonderful session um i uh so actually i i never actually took one of michael's classes because i was too afraid to and i regret it deeply um i think i shopped knowledge networks or 
um, one year and then I chickened out. But I think uh, Michael and I, we maintained a uh, like dip, um, scholarly relationship. Like he oversaw my thesis and things like that. Um, and yes, uh, back to uh, the topic at hand. Uh, yeah, it was enlightening for me to um, listen to this intersection of contemplative studies and sociology because um, I had some friends who who um, majored in or concentrated in contemplative studies at Brown, and I can see sort of the impact that that has had on their lives and the way that they navigate and see the world. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess my question for you, um, uh, Hiro, is uh, you mentioned earlier about sort of this focus on um, this transformation of faculty. Um, uh, and I believe that that's really important, um, but I'm wondering uh, whether you've had any thought or um, insight into what uh, transformation looks at the undergraduate level, because I'm at Penn and I think um, the University of Pennsylvania and I think our undergrads would definitely uh, benefit from uh, such contemplative practices in their daily lives. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for your you know, uh, question. And yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, you know, yes, I, I have taught um, two mindfulness-based courses um, here at SMU in Singapore. And uh, they are both uh, so-called capstone seminars. So you know, a seminar for graduating seniors and you know, facing uh, academic pressure you know, I think uh, Singapore environment is probably academically more competitive and stressful than in the US. And also they are facing enormous pressure. And you know, this is um, their final year and final semester and they felt enormous stress in finding a job after graduation. So in the past, um, like, you know, basically I piloted. So now uh, next semester we are going to uh, try out this mindfulness-based holistic education. Then in a way, I did a test run with my capstone seminar. Uh, I think you know, transformation was vis you know, most visible among students who had been most stressed. Yeah, of course. So through like a you know, weekly meditation practice, but also reading, uh, you know, research on mindfulness, understanding scientific underpinnings of effects of mindfulness-based intervention. So typically like an MBSR, it's, um, it was designed for working adults who don't have time uh, to do readings. But then at undergraduate level, we can afford to incorporate readings to clarify um, you know, the effects of uh, mindfulness practice. And yeah, um, my course was built around um, MBSR and also the Plum Village tradition. Then and also like, you know, this is an undergraduate uh, course. So we can also like, you know, um, ask students to do uh, group projects, right? Group projects. So they, they know how to collaborate effectively with other students. So group projects, will add uh, more value because uh, students can learn relational mindfulness. So, but you know, if I teach it again, I would emphasize um, more, you know, more on how to cultivate positive seeds or like positivity um, in ourselves. Uh, in the past, I was skeptical of positive psychology you know, as a sociologist, but uh, in recent years, I became more sympathetic with what uh, positive psychologists have been trying to do. And this is also based on my own experience. So many students, um, they have initially have difficulty moving their attention away from negative events in the past. They, they keep ruminating or they keep worrying about you know, uh, what, what's going to happen in the future. So, 
Of course, with mindfulness practice, we can help students shift their attention away from negativity to the present moment. But then here, we are simply asking students to shift attention away, away from negativity. Then students don't know where they should direct their attention to instead. And of course, you know, students can direct their attention to the present, but if this present is anchored uh, in their vision of flourishing, you know, this is a this is how I want to um, you know, live my life. You know, and this is a you know, kind of energy, kind of like a somatic states that I want to fill myself with. So unless you know, students are clear about what like, positive image of their flourishing, uh, it's difficult for them to keep their attention away from negativity. So if we can cultivate like, you know, positive vision of flourishing, then I realize that you know, it, it's actually easier for students to shift their attention away from negativity because now they know where they should pay attention to this uh, positive image of flourishing. So that's why this uh, latest intervention at SMU uh, you know, incorporates positive psychology. Yeah. So I hope um, we can you know, more effectively help uh, our students in the future. And of course, institutional settings in the US and Singapore are different. So uh, I don't think there can be a like, direct translation between the US and Singapore. But yeah, that's where you know, I've been thinking. That's where uh, I'm going now. Yeah, to emphasize more like, you know, positivity, help students visualize their you know, vision of flourishing. Yeah, so that I hope that can help students um, like, you know, keep growing, not only just like, you know, coping with their stress, you know, not just coping with their stress, I also move from suffering to flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my thought. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Soyun. Um, Josh is the only hand I see up left. I know somebody else had their hand up earlier and I know who it was. So I might come back to you. There you are, Penelope. I was hoping to get your input. But let's have uh, Josh give his so we can continue moving down that youthful ladder. Not to say anything, Penelope, but you were were a Brown student. Okay, Josh. Uh, hello. Yeah, um, I'm a freshman here at Brown. I'm planning on studying contemplative studies. Also interested in sociology. I'm taking uh, Professor Kennedy's Intro Sociology course. Um, thank you so much, Hiro, for your insights. Um, super impactful. Um, just a quick question for you. Um, so I think we all see a, a battle playing out on a national scale and also on a global scale between those who seek to preserve current hegemonies out of self-interest and those who seek to break down those hegemonies in order to create a more just world. So how could we approach teaching mindfulness and compassion to those who see little beyond self-interest, especially given the current climate of many conservative political leaders um, and media sources provoking fear and misunderstanding among these individuals? A great question. <laughs> great question, Joshua. Um, yeah, that's a you know, very, very important question. And, you know, then right now I have a, you know, two, a two tentative thoughts or like a two tentative practices that I'm pursuing. And one is, and you know, they are re related. So in the past, um, I was primarily a sociologist or like a social scientist. So I focused on you know, criticizing the government and corporations. And I tried to like, you know, find a way to press those existing organizations to change, right? Of course, that's one, one way to pass social change. But now I'm doing more of a different way of pursuing social change is basically to create alternative vision and alternative community, right? So let's say, you know, if I, um, if I see a problem with 
let's say a university, I, I have a choice to I can press this university to change, right? But then another option that I have is, okay, then why don't I create a new university that embodies alternative values, visions, and aspirations? And if this new university resonates with more people and young people, right? Then over time, people will migrate from the old system to the new system. So I think uh, we need both venues. We need people who push existing organizations, government and corporations, but we also need another group of people who are creating new and alternative ways of living. So now I'm working on this uh, second route and related, so you know, this may, this second route may take longer. No. But and, you know, it may not yield visible short-term outcomes. But in the long run, I feel the second way um, can really create and uh, change the world. And I think if you look at the world of businesses, basically that's what the innovators do. Uh, they create um, something new. So if, um, you know, of course, you know, they create something new based on what's available. So if Steve Jobs or Apple invented iPhone, then you know, people started migrating from the old system to the new system, right? So I think we can do something like that uh, with social change. Then related to that, um, you know, it's very important for us to support each other if we are like-minded uh, because, um, because when we like, you know, criticize or when we problematize uh, the status quo, and we don't want to act with the energy of anger or hatred, right? We want to act with the energy of understanding. And but of course, it's difficult. Uh, sometimes uh, people, let's say, who are right now very selfish or like, you know, who don't care about other people, you know, they may, they may, say, they may say things to us, you know, critical things or even like you know, hateful things. But then if we react to... You know, those people with the same energy, like the energy of anger, hostility, hatred, then we cannot hope for social, social change or better world. So we need to, in a way, like hold each other's hands. We need to support each other so that we can grow in numbers. So, you know, to, you know, there's a very, um, interesting connection between you know, culture and organization. And I'm sure you can explore it in Michael's courses, but if we want to change culture or knowledge, yeah, we can change um, organization. And to change organization, yeah, we need uh, like-minded people and we need to um, act together. So, so that's like you know, two routes uh, of social change that I'm pursuing. Create an alternative way of doing things then uh, stick together with like-minded people so we can grow in numbers yeah, yeah. so uh, that, that's all yeah <laughs> thank you thank you michael your mic is muted Uh, so I was just saying thank you to Hero, but also thank you to Josh for showing, you know, what intro social with Kennedy looks like, because you just made a greater impression, I think, than I could ever manage. Um, Penelope, did you want to jump in here and then we'll go to Rio Taro? Oh, oh, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, um, thank you, Hero, for your wonderful talk. Um, it just really hits home the topic of the sociological imagination, contemplative practices and social change. Uh, they go so well together and we need to put them together. And I wanna thank you all for the questions, Hal, wonderful job and Mary about healing and, 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 and So Yoon at UPenn and everyone just added so much wonderful insight to the conversation. And Josh, to my younger self, I remember being a freshman at Brown many, many years ago 
Um, and we're not going to count those years right now, but I didn't take Michael's class. <laughs> I did take an intro sociology class back in the day, but we didn't have contemplative practices, nor that kind of program. Um, but Brown, you know, uh, brought me to many different places, particularly to Brazil and lived there for 12 years and uh, work with, uh, of course, um, critical pedagogy. That was my first uh, you know, uh, interesting um, marrying with sociology and social change and with regard to higher education and what we can do in the classroom. So, you know, as a sociology professor for 25 plus years, you know, teaching multiple intro sociology, I know Michael can relate to that. Um, you know, you know, teaching the sociological imagination here, I know you have too, over and over again, Mills, personal troubles, public issues, you know, understanding the interplay of, you know, self and society, biography and history. And, you know, you know, as I taught that, you know, a lot of my students would, oh yeah, I get it. But it was essentially an intellectual kind of conversation about, you know, understanding how social structure and, you know, uh, if impacts the individuals. And it just didn't seem that empowering, you know, okay, we can intellectually understand how, you know, society shapes us. And yeah, the forces of capitalism and rationalization, you know, all affect us and okay, now what? And all I had was, you know, social change. It will take years, but we'll get there. Um, and it just didn't seem that empowering. Um, and so over the years, I kind of, you know, played with that for a while, you know, and then we were reading, um, you know, Richard Sennett, Hidden Injuries of Class. Um, and of course, you know, you notice how, you know, capitalism and, you know, of course, Weber rationalization, but we'll stick with capitalism, you know, um, you know, affects uh, disenfranchised individuals. And when we're reading, you know, injuries of class, how issues of self-esteem and just pain, um, um, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the injuries and the bruises that may not show on our skin, but are part of um, what we have you know, experienced in life. And, and, and for me, it was like, okay, um, how do we, what do we do with that? You know, if we have all these people that are hurting um, and what do we do? And so, you know, as I, you know, in my sociology classes, I see students coming into class, you know, nervous and stressed. And back in the day, we'd have journals. So they were writing the journals and then kind of expressing themselves, making the connection to self and society and noticing where their, you know, underlining dis-ease came from. And then it was like, okay, you know, what do we do? We notice that, you know, our stress and our pain, where it comes from, but how do we alleviate that? How do we move to more healing practices? And again, that took me on the journey as you did probably into yoga. I'm a yoga instructor now um, and brought me into Buddhist studies and yoga practices. I think we need to do a breathing exercise right now. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it, it felt as though a way to not only bring in critical pedagogy, of course, um, to make a more democratic classroom, but also as we started doing that, we started noticing the suffering that was going on in each individual lives collectively. And then we said, okay, what do we do with that? And so then starting to infuse classes with these contemplative practices, not just meditation, but a series of just body, becoming aware of your body and body scans and noticing where you're holding that kind of tension. And, and to, to what Mary was saying, sometimes people felt very, I would get in the journal, no, I can't do this. I can't sit still. This brings up too much. I cannot sit still. I feel very um, uneasy being quiet. I, you know, I cry, I become very upset because all that stuff started bubbling to the surface. And I said, oh my God, what am I doing? Am I harming students by infusing contemplative practice in the classroom, which allowed me to be more reflexive on my practice and how do I create a safe environment or a safe space as, as um, I think someone said, jo Jacob said, how do you create that you know, space for healing to occur in a college classroom? And of course, working with maybe not, you know, Brown of course is a more privileged you know, arena, um, and I was experimenting in more um, with people with less means and um, uh, uh, a lot of struggles. And, 
And so it brought me to creating this class um, called uh, the unmcdonaldization of self in everyday life. So again, uh, so um, so infusing the class, which is actually going to run in the spring again in um, at Worcester State. I ran it once at Holyoke Community College, and and now I'm running it at Worcester State, and really trying to find that um, that conversation. So I know, uh, you know, you know, bringing in terms like energy and was a way to um, kind of complement Mills. You know, Mills is that intellectual understanding, okay, we get how society, um, you know, affects our, who we are, but we need to heal. And then bringing a language of emotion, bringing in, you know, that, that other terrain, that fuzzy terrain. Um, but we know that MSMBR, you know, changes the brain, you know, the neuroplasticity, we know all that kind of stuff from the research. And, you know, so a, a, there's a lot of things going on. And so, I think that, you know, my own experimentation in the classroom has, you know, brought me to a place where I'm, uh, sometimes I get a little bit nervous, like Mary said about introducing because I do want, don't want to cause harm because I know things will come up. When you heal, things come up like the Body Keeps Score book, you know, the, you know, how yoga can be used as, you know, a trauma kind of healing. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that as faculty, you know, moving into this terrain, we need to be very aware and very cautious and very compassionate and caring of the beautiful people that come into our classroom. How do we, um, you know, engage that in a place that really creating that safe space. And so as I move forward, I'd like Hero to address, um, you know, uh, you know, as faculty are, you know, moving into this arena, um, we need, how do we maintain that safety um, um, so we don't do harm? And as we, you know, you know, move into this arena of energy, which is um, a new space for higher education, right? Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much for sharing your experience and observation, Penelope. And uh, your question is um, yeah, very important and yeah, very consequential. So yeah, how to maintain safe space for students? Um, I think, you know, of course, uh, you know, all we can do is to do our best. And of course, uh, sometimes, you know, unexpected things can happen. Um, I cannot like you know, guarantee 100% satisfaction, like 100% you know, success. But um, you know, definitely, um, you know, we want to you know, embody mindfulness um, by ourselves very well. So, actually, you know, once um, you know, monk from the Pun village uh, cautioned me against uh, incorporating incorporating mindfulness into my classes because he thought he didn't say it, but he thought he suspected I was not mindful enough. Yet I was not trained enough to do it. Yeah, so then I actually delayed um, for a couple of years uh, doing a little bit more practice. So yeah, um, so far, uh, yeah, yes, we we need to recognize the you know, risks that uh, Mary and you, Penelope, uh, mentioned. So first, we need to um, train ourselves uh, sufficiently. But of course, at some point, we need to jump. Right into practice because we cannot wait until we become fully enlightened, right? Because uh, stress and you know issues are you know, happening in the world on campus, and we want to do something. So that's why like, you know, we decided to incorporate, let's say, mindfulness into our class. And I think um, so. In addition to uh, you know main. Uh, training ourselves uh, first. Uh, one, one thing I keep in mind is to be um, joyful. Yeah, so I really like um, the Dalai Lama because he's like a laughing Buddha uh, for me. So of course, uh, you know, as many students, uh, especially um, female students, you know, they have some, um, some, some issues and you know, I, I read their 
journal entries, uh, of, you know, privately, and I gave them my uh, private comments and feedback. But yes, um, it's it's very important for us to be joyful, and that can infect my students um, in some way. So being joyful is one thing, and another thing is um, I use nature, natural environment, because. For example, you know, we can do sitting meditation in the classroom, but in terms of healing and relaxation, I find it more uh, helpful if we do a walking meditation outside. Maybe if there is a you know, campus green, we can do it uh, on a campus green, or if there is a you know, uh, forest or woods nearby, uh, we can do it. Uh, spending time in nature can really uh, help us uh, heal. So. I try to incorporate those uh, uh, external uh, things like natural environment uh, into uh, my class and that helps. And, and uh, beyond that, I, I have um, two ongoing experimentations and I haven't had uh, outcomes yet, uh, maybe one, uh, one experimentation. One is actually, to pay more attention to our diet, uh, what we eat. Uh, what I have realized is that uh, we can practice contemplation, but if our diet doesn't change, it can actually hinder our contemplative practice. Uh, that's my own experience because now, I'm not sure whether there's like any people, anyone from uh, public health here, but now, uh, more and more medical researchers um, are producing you know, research on how food creates inflammation in our body and in our brain, and how processed food you know, contributes to chronic inflammation, which is a cause of chronic illnesses. And in my experience, if, if like, you know, those inflammation persists in our body or in our brain. Um, the potential of mindfulness practice to uh, like, you know, make use of neuroplasticity uh, is severely compromised. So to change our you know, brain circuit, like how neurons fire, in addition to meditation, I feel um, changing diet and make sure that you know uh, inflammation is getting reduced in our brain and body uh, seems to be crucial so diet seems to be very crucial so nutrition yeah so yes and you are like a very holistic approach this is so that's something that you know, i'm going to experiment i haven't experimented it, it with my students but i experimented it with myself and I, I realize that diet can really make a difference in your pursuit of contemplative practice. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, how we are back now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you for your question, Penelope. I, I just shared with you my ongoing experiments. Yeah. Thank you, Hira. Thank you, Penelope. It's so, it's so nice to hear two sociologists who are contemplatives talking to each other. So, uh, Ria Taro, you haven't said anything yet, but then how about, would this be all right, Hiro, if we uh, take Ria Taro's comment and then Jacob's and then Hal's and you could respond. And then I just want to offer a final concluding thought because we're scheduled to end at nine. I would rather go all night, but I suspect that's not a healthy practice. So why don't, why don't we turn to Ria Taro, please? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the talk, as you already know, I'm very, uh, my interest very much overlaps with my been talking about this one, my research does. So it's been very inspiring. Um, was one um, question or like a comment that I had is about like one of the difficulties about incorporating my fullness into um, context such as higher education, which is like uh, the context of higher education is particular in the sense that it 
as a whole strives for some form of achievement, whether it be achievement in tests or achievement of knowledge or achievement of a skill. But mindfulness in itself is in the spirit of non striving as a whole. So when you teach mindfulness in higher education, sometimes in, in the readings and uh, research articles that I've read, sometimes the tendency is to is for students to think that they need to achieve mindfulness, whatever that means. <laughs> so they in turn become rather stressed sometimes. And oh, I understand like this can be dealt with with um, proper feedbacks and discussions. But at the same time, I also feel like this is as uh, Professor Sweeney was saying in his first question, like a uh, conflict of cultures with uh, modern mind and higher education and mindfulness. So it's just my comment. Uh, that was just my uh, thoughts that I had on this sentence. Thank you, Ryotaro. Uh, Jacob, can you add your comment and then Hal, and then we'll turn to you, Hiro? Yes, I wanted to just add quickly based on some of the. Um, responses to my citing of this uh, uh, heart circle ceremony and also the question of how to create a safe space because that is um, a very crucial question we've asked every time we've facilitated one of these especially with uh, 14 to 18 year olds we're asking them to be extremely vulnerable um, in a in the in nature essentially and so the um, importance of making sure that they have the support they need when they are they allow themselves to go into this space is pretty central to uh, our thoughts. Um, but definitely things, uh, you mentioned nature. Um, it's usually takes place on a farm, sometimes at a Waldorf school. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, overlap here, um, especially for how to uh, maintain, like you, when you're processing many people's extreme traumas, it can get a little sad. <laughs> um, and so how do you maintain a space that isn't just exceptionally um, depressing? And, and that, that can kind of have that kind of negative feedback and make people uh, uh, have the opposite of reaction that you would, you would like. Um, and just one of the things we do is in between everybody, every speaker is either that person volunteers a song to sing um, or they ask the community to provide one. Um, and what that does essentially is Kind of clears the space musically um, and I found that uh, all ranges of, of songs from comical to beautiful to uh, just kind of whatever fits in the moment really uh, profoundly impacts the energy in the room um, as, as well as diet. Uh, there's a lot of um, con like conscious thought that goes into providing the food for this camp um, and, uh, and for many of the youths it's the best they've eaten their whole lives. So um, it is uh, crucial for doing any kind of internal work, having access to kind of regular predictable meals that are um, nutritional and uh, supportive to the work. And if anyone's interested in looking up more, it's um, the organization is called PYE, Partners for Youth Empowerment. Um, they do a lot of international work in India and in Greece. Uh, they started in the Pacific Northwest and they've kind of expanded from there, doing lots of cool educational experiments. Thank you, Jacob. Partners for Youth and Empowerment, yeah? Yeah, thank you again for the talk. Yeah, and uh, we'll ask Cal to offer a final comment, then we'll turn it over to you, Hero, before I offer a final benediction, okay? <laughs> um, Hero, thank you for such a, a rich and wonderfully interesting um, talk. and. To all the people who've commented and asked questions, it's, it's been a just a wonderful way to spend a couple of hours. Um, I wanted to, there's so many things that were touched upon. Um, I I really appreciate your idea of creating a, an alternate vision of a different kind of world and a different way of operating in the world, and I think. It's really important to do that, especially at this point in time, um, 
when the what um, Ricoeur once called the hermeneutics of suspicion has gotten outside of the university and pervades society in very corrosive ways, undermining our trust in one another and our belief that there is a different way to organize ourselves in the world. Um, so the alternate vision is very important. Training of teachers is absolutely crucial. And very early on in our, our organization of the contemplative studies program here, um, we discuss very seriously um, how much and of what kind of training in a contemplative tradition is necessary to do X number of minutes of certain kinds of contemplative practice teachings in the classroom. That document is somewhere on our website. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested, I can probably help you find it on the website. Um, what to do in the class? I mean, students, our students are stressed. This is a very stressful time of, of, of life, whether you're in university or outside university. Um, and, uh, but what I've discovered is over the, over the two decades I've taught contemplative practices and a lot of meditation, there's a lot of meditation involved in meeting two or three times a week to do this. Um, and we have developed a, a, a method for doing that, um, uh, a kind of structured pedagogy that we call integrative contemplative pedagogy. Um, uh, but my, uh, our experience, not just mine, has been that students have benefited much more uh, from being in the in a, in these kinds of classrooms that encourage critical first person investigation of contemplative practices within a third person variety of third person contexts. They benefit so much more. There's so much more benefit than harm. That there, there's there's never been a question in my mind that that this is this is the way to proceed and the way that this is a way forward um, in uh, in higher education. Uh, I also appreciate the uh, the need to create a sense of community and a, a, a community of mutual trust. So I often talk to my students about, you know, for the next uh, 12 weeks, we're part of a, a kind of we're members of a symphony orchestra and we're about to perform a symphony over through time and space. Each one of you is, is a, is a specialist in an instrument and the work that you put in and the way you interact with one another, um, creates the music of the course that we are about to engage in. Um, and that there are no wrong questions. There are no questions that are too basic. Um, and that, uh, there, there are a series of things that you can do, and I'm sure Mary has kind of best practices for how you establish at the beginning of a course a community of mutual support and trust. And that's absolutely essential um, to do in the classroom. And finally, a sense of humor uh, and, and having a kind of playfulness that you mentioned, I think is, you know, in a sense of joy is, is also essential. And um, so I actually... You know, I always tell my students one of the reasons I teach courses on Buddhism is so that I have an audience for Buddhist puns. And so I want to end my my comments with one of my favorite Buddhist puns, which I haven't really had a chance to tell lately um, because uh, I've tended to not be as corny uh, during COVID for whatever reason. I, I'm not quite sure why. And that is, why was the drunken Buddhist none condemned to eternal rebirth? That's the question. And the answer is, Larson has heard this many times before, it's because she fell into a stupa. <laughs> so, apologies and a deep expression of thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Hal. Hero, why don't you offer some final reflections, if you would? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for like, you know, all your um, you know, comments, uh, uh, you know, final comments. And yeah, it sounds like um, you know, Brown is a very good place for like, you know, exploring you know, this uh, intersection between social science and uh, contemplative studies, and also how to incorporate uh, contemplative studies and practices into you know, the entire curriculum 
holistically and organically. So it was really uh, encouraging and heartening for me uh, to you know, hear your responses and just you know, to make um, you know, specific responses to the last uh, three uh, people who asked questions. So yeah, to how, yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, I, you, are, you are very funny and in the plant, plant village tradition you know, we say happy teachers change the world. So if we are happy, our students will be happy. Yeah, and also uh, in response to Jacob, you know, this alternative vision of you know, living, being and operating, it's already embodied in your efforts, right? This uh, partner for youth empowerment. So there are already people who are trying to promote this alternative um, way of being. So that's great. And yeah, and response to uh, Ryotaro, yeah, if students ever feel you know, pressure to achieve mindfulness, yeah, I mean, we can actually laugh together, right? So in a way, we cannot take this too seriously. And of course, we want to take it seriously, but we want to do it with playfulness, joy, and fun. So now uh, to you, Michael. Well, talk about combining seriousness and thoughtfulness with joy and many smiles across this Zoom screen. Just want to make a couple of remarks very quickly. First, this contemplative program, this contemplative studies at Brown, I'm new to it, but it has been such a source of inspiration and approaching a sense of what I don't have in enlightenment. It has really been challenging, but joyful. So it's, I'm grateful for the invitation. The second thing though, is re reflecting on how I became involved. We were having curricular review of the program and it was on the heels of COVID. And as I was learning more about the program, I was struck by how much all of the students at Brown would benefit from a more contemplative way of being. Uh, especially when we were all suffering uh, what COVID represented. So I think the university is coming to appreciate and recognize that ever more. At least this was the sense I got in the curricular review. So I'm grateful to this community here at Brown, but I'm grateful to the Zoom community that has been inspired to assemble because of Hero. You know, I have always, even when he was a first year graduate student, you know, admired Hero for the breadth and thoughtfulness of his scholarship and his way of being. Um, I now regret that our ages were not reversed um, so that I could have been the student of Professor Saito, but I think I am right now. And I'm, I wanna conclude with what I feel like is one of the profound revelations you have left me, Hero. And it's this, I used to joke, and I don't know if you remember this from Ann Arbor days, I used to joke, because I used to study business school professors and students. I said, you know, business school professors and students only pick problems that they can solve. Sociologists always pick problems they can't solve. And, you know, it really makes sense. And, and so when you were talking about the move towards social entrepreneurship, I was thinking, oh, Hero is doing that move. He's moving toward the creation of something that he can realize. And ah, you know, the social entrepreneurs that I know, they are generally very positive people. They are creators. And I can think about the ways in which we can see that within universities. There are creative spaces that are making alternatives so that we might emulate them. But then I think about that other mode, that older hero that I knew who was interested in challenging. And I was beginning to miss him. But then this is the revelation that I got from you. And that is actually that old hero is sort of folded into this new hero because you are not just challenging with alternative visions, but you are inviting those who are reproducing the sources of our suffering to see the alternative that they can help make. And so I'm thinking about the life in our university right now. We are filled with pain. Every institution is filled with pain and opposition and antagonism. And so the next time I'm in one of those settings, I'm going to be thinking about how might I 
live a more compassionate way of being, thinking about my friend Hiro Saito and maybe even moving someone who doesn't yet know Hiro Saito to find inspiration in the model that you have created. So I just want to thank you, Hiro, for assembling us all and thank everyone who was participating this evening. It was a wonderful session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Till next time. Hiro, can you stay on for just a sec? May I stay on for one a sec, too? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've been okay. Old friend. silent, Mujahid. <laughs> Can I stay on too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should let Anne go if you're ready to go, Anne. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, let me so, go on first then, but I, Well, I just want to introduce yeah. Soyun Muchahid here is also on the screen, and Muchahid was also at Michigan and a very mindful and thoughtful person, always bringing spirituality and sociology into profound dialogue. You know, I should have said uh, that, um, you know, I was, you know, I was coming from religious background and sociology is a dry, you know, it's, you know, materialistic, whatever, progressive uh, space. And, you know, you were well, compassionate, Michael. Hold on one second. I'm going to...